Acid Communism, Unfinished Introduction, by Mark Fisher The specter of a world which could be free. The closer the real possibility of liberating the individual from the constraints once justified by scarcity and immaturity, the greater the need for maintaining and streamlining these constraints, lest the established order of domination dissolve. Civilization has to protect itself against the specter of a world which could be free. In exchange for the commodities that enrich their lives, individuals sell not only their labor but also their free time. People dwell in apartment concentrations and have private automobiles with which they can no longer escape into a different world. They have huge refrigerators stuffed with frozen foods. They have dozens of newspapers and magazines which espouse the same ideals. They have innumerable choices, innumerable gadgets, which are all of the same sort and keep them occupied and divert their attention from the real issue which is the awareness that they could both work less and determine their own needs and satisfactions. Herbert Marcuse, Eros and Civilization The claim of the book is that the last 40 years have been about the exercising of, quote, the specter of a world which could be free, unquote. Adopting the perspective of such a world allows us to reverse the emphasis of much recent left-wing struggle. Instead of seeking to overcome capital, we should focus on what capital must always obstruct, the collective capacity to produce, care, and enjoy. We on the left have had it wrong for a while. It is not that we are anti-capitalist, it is that capitalism, with all its visored cups, its tear gas, all the theological niceties of its economics, is set up to block the emergence of this red plenty. The overcoming of capital has to be fundamentally based on the simple insight that, Far from being about wealth creation, capital necessarily and always blocks the production of common wealth. The principle, though by no means the sole agent involved in the exorcism of the specter of a world which could be free, is the project that has been called neoliberalism. But neoliberalism's real target was not its official enemies. The decadent monolith of the Soviet bloc, the crumbling compacts of social democracy and the New Deal, which were collapsing under the weight of their own contradictions. Instead, Neoliberalism is best understood as a project aimed at destroying, to the point of making them unthinkable, the experiments in democratic socialism and libertarian communism that were efflorescing at the end of the 60s and the beginning of the 70s. The ultimate consequence of the elimination of these possibilities was the condition I have called capitalist realism, the fatalistic acquiescence in the view that there is no alternative to capitalism. If there was a founding event of capitalist realism, it would be the violent destruction of the Allende government in Chile by General Pinochet's American-backed coup. Allende was experimenting with a form of democratic socialism, which offered a real alternative both to capitalism and to Stalinism. The military destruction of the Allende regime and the subsequent mass imprisonments and torture are the only, the most violent and dramatic example the lengths capital has go in order to make itself appear to be the only, quote, realistic, unquote, mode of organizing society. It wasn't only that a new form of socialism was terminated in Chile. The country also became a lab in which the measures which would be rolled out in, in other hubs of neoliberalism were trialed. In countries like the U.S. and the U.K., the implementation of capitalist realism was a much more piecemeal affair, involving inducements and seductions as well as repression. The ultimate effect was the same. The extirpation of the very idea of democratic socialism or libertarian communism, the exercising of the specter of a world which could be free, was a cultural as well as narrowly political question. For this specter and the possibility of a world beyond toil was raised most potently in culture, even or perhaps especially in culture, which didn't necessarily think of itself as politically oriented. Marcuse explains why this is the case and the declining influence of his work in recent years tells its own story. One Dimensional Man, a book which emphasizes the gloomier side of his work, has remained a reference point, but Eros and Civilization, like many of his other works, has long been out of print. His critique of capitalism's total administration of life and subjectivity continued to resonate, whereas the claims Marcuse's conviction that art constituted a great refusal to protest against that which is, came to seem like outmoded romanticism, quaintly irrelevant in the age of capitalist realism. Yet Marcuse had already forestalled such criticisms 
and the critique in one-dimensional man has traction because it comes from a second space and aesthetic dimension radically incompatible with everyday life under capitalism. Marcuse argued that, in actuality, the traditional images of artistic alienation associated with Romanticism do not belong to the past. Instead, he said, in formulation, they recall and preserve in memory what belongs to the future, images of a gratification that would destroy the society that suppresses it. The Great Refusal rejected not only capitalist realism, but realism as such. There is, he wrote, an inherent conflict between art and political realism. Art was a positive alienation, a rational negation of the existing order of things. His Frankfurt School predecessor, Theodore Adorno, had placed a similar value on the intrinsic alterity of experimental art. In Adorno's work, however, we are invited to inv endlessly examine the wounds of a damaged life under capital. The idea of a world beyond capital is dispatched into a, into a utopian beyond. Art only marks our distance from this utopia. By contrast, Marcuse vividly evokes, as an immediate prospect, a world totally transformed. It was no doubt this quality of his work meant Marcuse was taken up so enthusiastically by elements of the 60s counterculture. He had anticipated the counterculture's challenge to a world dominated by meaningless labor. The most politically significant figures in literature, he argued, in One Dimensional Man, were those who don't earn a living, at least not in an, in an ordinary and normal way. Such characters and the forms of life which they are associated would come to the fore in the counterculture. Actually, as Marcuse's work was in tune with the counterculture, his analysis also forecast its ultimate failure and incorporation. A major theme of One Dimensional Man was the neutralization of the aesthetic challenge. Marcuse worried about the popularization of the avant-garde, not out of elitist anxieties that, that the democratization of culture could corrupt the purity of art, but because the absorption of art into the administered spaces of capitalist commerce would gloss over its incompatibility with capitalist culture. He had already seen capitalist culture convert the gangster, the beatnik, and the vamp from images of another way of life into freaks or types of the same life. The same would happen to the counterculture, many of whom poignantly preferred to call themselves freaks. In any case, Marcuse allows us to see why the 60s continue to nag at the current moment. In recent years, the 60s have come to seem at once like a deep past, so exotic and distant that we cannot imagine living in it. And a moment more vivid than now, a time when people really lived, when things really happened, Yet the decade haunts us not because of some unrecoverable and unrepeatable confluence of factors, but because the potentials it materialized began to democratize, the prospect of a life freed from drudgery, has to be continually suppressed. To explain why we have not moved into a world beyond work, we have to look at a vast social, political, and cultural pro project whose aim has been the production of scarcity. Capitalism, a system that generates artificial scarcity in order to produce real scarcity. A system that produces real scarcity in order to generate artificial scarcity. Actual scarcity, scarcity of natural resources, now haunts capital, as the real that its fantasy of infinite expansion must work over time to repress. The artificial scarcity, which is fundamentally a scarcity of time, is necessary, as Marcuse says, in order to distract us from the imminent possibility of freedom. Neoliberalism's victory, of course, depended upon a co-option of, of the concept of freedom. Neoliberal freedom, evidently, is not freedom from work, but freedom through work. Just as Marcuse predicted, the availability of more consumer goods and devices in the global north has obscured the way in which those same goods have increasingly functioned to produce a scarcity of time. But perhaps even Marcuse could not have anticipated 21st century capital's capacity to generate overwork and to administer the time outside paid work. Maybe only a mordant futurologist like Philip K. Dick could have predicted the banal ubiquity of corporate communication today, its penetration into practically all areas of consciousness in everyday life. Quote, the past is so much safer, unquote, observes one of the narrators in Margaret Atwood's dystopian satire, the heart goes last, quote, because 
Whatever is in it hasn't already happened. It can't be changed. So, in a way, there's nothing to the dread, unquote. Despite what Atwood's narrator thinks, the past hasn't already happened. The past has to be continually re-narrated, and the political point of reactionary narratives is to suppress the potentials which still await, ready to be reawakened in older moments. The 60s counterculture is now inseparable from its own simulation, and the reduction of the decade to, quote, iconic, unquote, images to classic music and nostalgic reminiscences has neutralized the real promises that exploded then. Those aspects of the counterculture which could be appropriated have been repurposed as precursors of the new spirit of capitalism, while those which were incompatible with a world of overwork have been condemned as so many idle doodles, which in the contradictory logic of reaction are simultaneously dangerous and impotent. The subduing of the counterculture has seemed to confirm the validity of the skepticism and hostility to the kind of position Marcuse was advancing. If, quote, the counterculture led to neoliberalism, unquote, better that the counterculture had not happened. In fact, the opposite argument is more convincing, that the failure of the left after the 60s had much to do with its repudiation of, or refusal to engage with, the dreamings that the counterculture unleashed. There was no inevitability about the new rights seizure and binding of these new currents to its project of mandatory individualization and overwork. What if the counterculture was only a stumbling beginning, rather than the best that could be hoped for? What if the success of neoliberalism was not an indication of the inevitability of capitalism, but a testament to the scale of the threat posed by the specter of a society which could be free? It is in the spirit of these questions that this book shall return to the 1960s and 70s. The rise of capitalist realism could not have happened without narratives that reactionary forces told about those decades. Returning to those moments will allow us to continue with the process of unpicking the narratives that neoliberalism has woven around them. More importantly, it will enable the construction of new narratives. In many ways, rethinking the 1970s is more important than revisiting the 60s. The 70s was the decade that neoliberalism began a rise that it would retrospectively narrate as irresistible. However, recent work in the 70s, including Jefferson Cowie's Staying Alive, The Last Days of the Working Class, Andy Beckett's When the Lights Went Out, and John Medhurst's That Option No Longer Exist, has emphasized that the decade wasn't only about the draining away of the possibilities that exploded in the 60s. The 70s was a point of struggle and transition in which the meaning and legacy of the previous decade was one of the crucial battlegrounds. Some of the emancipatory tendencies that had emerged during the 60s intensified and proliferated during the 70s. Quote, for many politicized Britons, Andy Beckett has written, the decade was not the hangover after the 60s. It was the point when the great 60s party actually started. The successful miners' strike of 1972 saw an alliance between the striking miners and students that was echoed in similar convergences in Paris, 1968, with miners using the University of Essex's Colchester campus as their East Anglian base. Moving far beyond the simple story that the 60s led to neoliberalism, these new readings of the 1970s allow us to apprehend the intelligence, ferocious energy, and improvisational imagination of the neoliberal counter-revolution. The installation of capitalist realism was by no means a simple restoration of an old state of affairs. The mandatory individualism imposed by neoliberalism was a new form of individualism, an individualism defined against the different forms of collectivity that clamored out of the 1960s. This new individualism was designed to both surpass and make us forget those collective forms. So to recall these multiple forms of collectivity is less an act of remembering than of unforgetting, a counter-exorcism of the specter of a world which could be free. Acid communism is the name I have given to this specter. The concept of acid communism is a provocation and a promise. It is a joke of sorts, but one with a very serious purpose. It points to something that, at one point, seemed inevitable, but which now appears impossible. The convergence of class consciousness, socialist-feminist consciousness raising, 
and psychedelic consciousness, the fusion of new social movements with the communist project, and unprecedented aestheticization of everyday life. Acid communism both refers to actual historical developments and to a virtual confluence that has not yet come together in actuality. Potentials exert influence without being actualized. Actual social formations are shaped by the potential formations whose actualization they seek to impede. The impress of a world which could be free can be detected in the very structures of capitalist realist world which makes fr freedom impossible. The late cultural critic Ellen Willis said that the transformations imagined by the counterculture would have required a social and psychic revolution of almost inconceivable magnitude. It's very difficult in our more deflated times to recreate the counterculture's confidence that such a social and psychic revolution could not only happen, but was already in the process of unfolding. But we need now to return to a time when the prospect of universal liberation seemed imminent.